We're back. This is Dave Vellante with Stu Miniman, and this is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE Wikibon's continuous production. We're here live at Gillette Stadium. This is the VTUG winter warmer. Brad Anderson is here. He's a corporate vice president with Microsoft. Uh, Brad, welcome to theCUBE. Ah, thanks, for, uh, thanks for inviting me. It's good to be here. Yeah, so the VTUG has sort of evolved. You know, it's come from the sort of narrow sort of event, and now it's this sort of multi-hypervisor, multi-constituency event. Obviously, Microsoft's you know, done a lot to advance the the market you know, beyond VMware, and so congratulations on your progress. Thank you. And we uh, really appreciate the, the support here. So, you know, the knock on Microsoft is always, well, the first version really doesn't get it quite right, the second version is almost there, and the third version is like a home run. And when you talk to the practitioners in the Wikibon community, you know, things like Windows Server you know, 2012, uh, uh, Hyper-V, I mean, they all go hand in hand. It really seems to be clicking for you guys now. It seems like you really got it right, you mm -hmm. know, in this version. So. So is it, first of all, is that a fair assessment? And, uh, and what are you seeing in the customer base? Yeah, I think that may have been, a, been a, a fair assessment in the past. As I take a look at Windows Server, you know, my, my responsibility on Windows Server, you know, 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, 2012 R2, those have been world-class, you know, releases cadence, of the operating right? system. Yeah, and we've quickened the cadence, you know, mm -hmm. that cadence from 2012 to 2012 R2. You know, we did that in less than a year. You know, we had to fundamentally change all of our processes. But you know, if, if that was a knock in, in, in the back, which it was, you know, I think it was a realistic knock. I, I think our server releases have just been rock solid now. You know, for four four con consecutive releases, and I'll tell you, one of the things that has contributed to that is, you know, even when we bring a new technology into Windows Server, it's actually not the first time it's hit the market, because we have this design principle we call cloud first. So we literally will go out and we'll build things into Azure first, prove it in Azure, battle harden it, battle test it, then we deliver it in the Windows Server. So for example, a lot of the things I talked about this morning was a lot of the innovation that we're doing in storage. Okay, and so that innovation was actually pioneered in Azure, because all of our storage in, in, in Azure is direct attached storage. And then we brought it onto Windows Server, but it had already been proven in Azure. I'll tell you the other thing, you know, Hyper-V, Hyper-V is what powers all of Azure. All of Azure is built on Hyper-V. And so we will actually take new versions of Hyper-V, but you know, while we're in preview or pre-preview, put it into Azure, so we're testing it out at scale, at incredible performance before it ever hits the street in, in, inside a Windows Server. Yeah, Brad, uh, you know, some people I think really don't understand, you know, Azure's been out there a while, it's kind of a little bit under the radar, you know, Amazon was here, you know, that they have such a strong position in the marketplace. Do you have some proof points to talk to us a little bit about, you know, how Microsoft's doing in the cloud? You know, I think thought that was a great statement you said, you know, Azure's there to prove it out, as opposed to VMware really has kind of that base in the data centers today, and they're trying to push into the clouds as opposed to, you've got great footprints both in the data centers and, and the cloud, so can you give us a little bit of uh, data on that? And, and I think the, the point you make about Microsoft delivering solutions that are in private, hosted in public cloud is really the, the, the key message I think for everybody to hear here. You know, we are the only organization in the world that is operating and building a public cloud at scale, you know, available around the world with a, with a guaranteed SLA. You know, we're also the only organization, Amazon doesn't do this, we back our SLA fi financially. If we don't meet our SLA, you don't pay us. But we you know, literally are committed to this strategy of ensuring consistency across private, hosted, and public cloud. And what that means for our customers, for everyone watching this, is they're not locked into a cloud. So they can go do their dev tests in Azure, build that application, and then they've wanted to deploy that in a private cloud, they can do that without having to modify any code at all. They then want to move that to the public cloud or they want to move that to a service provider, they can do that without having to change a single line of code because we're doing the work to make sure that it's consistent. So the Azure you know, concept applied to the, to the private cloud on premise. Um, that's, I mean, everybody wants to build a cloud, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so, yeah. so talk about the evolution of that, because you know, early on, Azure, Hyperscale, you know, a lot of experimentation. How did that all get baked out and get into your group? And, and now what's happening in the customer base? Yeah, you know, so the, the, I, think, I think the key thing to think about here is, is, in my view, I think the most innovation that is happening in the cloud in the industry is happening in a handful of organizations that are operating these clouds at just incredible scale. You know, I mentioned this morning, in the last several years, we've spent more than $15 billion as we've built out Azure you know, the data centers, all the things that are inside of the data centers, and, and hosting these 200 plus services, you know, like Bing, like uh, uh, Skype, like Outlook.com. You know, and so in that environment, we, we get the opportunity to learn, like there's, like, like, like you, can't even, you can't even understand what a learning opportunity that is. You know, when you're spending $15 billion you know, over, over a couple of years, you're bringing in hundreds of thousands of servers at a time, we're making 50,000 networking changes a day. 
you have to innovate like crazy. You just have to innovate like crazy. And then from an engineering perspective, we want it to be common code because our costs are lower if we just have to build once and run everywhere. Just like customers want to be able to build an application or create an application and run everywhere. So we benefit, the customers benefit, and that's, that's been the core of the strategy. Now you ask, how did this all come about? Okay. And so initially, you know, Windows Azure and Windows Server were, were, were we, we started Windows Azure in, in a separate group, and you can kind of think a little bit about the innovator's dilemma. We wanted to give that team kind of free reign to go off and build and not be kind of encumbered. But then several years ago, we brought those two organizations together, and now those organizations sit side by side, and all the work that we do together is just remarkable. And I'll just give you one proof point that I think is, is, is really kind of tangible. One of the requests that we get is we want an organization to say, we want to have Windows Azure compatible private clouds. Windows Azure compatible hosted clouds. And so literally, we, 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 we have this, this deliverable we call the Windows Azure Pack, okay, WAP. Windows Azure Pack is literally taking capabilities that, that have been pioneered and proven in Windows Azure, delivering them on top of Windows Server. Okay, let's give you two or, two or three examples. First example is high density websites. Inside of Windows Azure, we literally can host more than 5,000 websites on a single Windows Server OS instance. Okay, that, that makes us lo very, very low cost. Well, every customer wants that. Whether you're running 100 or whether you're running 5,000, you want to get as dense as you can. So through the Windows Azure pack, we ship that, and now customers can get that same kind of density, that same kind of cost saving. I'll give you another example. One of the core parts of Azure is called Service Bus. And think about Service Bus as a queuing mechanism that developers can use to separate out, say, the front tier from the back end tier of an application. You can also use Service Bus as your, as your communication bus across multiple clouds. So a lot of applications that get built for Azure will take advantage of Service Bus. Well, guess what? Service Bus is now delivered on top of Windows Server through, through the Windows Server Azure pack. And so those applications that are built that are taking advantage of the Service Bus can run in a private cloud, or in a hosted cloud, or in a public cloud because we are delivering consistency across clouds. I mean, that homogeneity is a, is a big advantage of, of, of Microsoft. I mean, obviously, you know, Amazon is this homogene, homogeneous uh, entity. We were had, had the guys here on Rackspace before talking about OpenStack, and you know, it's evolving, but Microsoft has proven that you can actually go from public to private and, and, and in between. Um, talk about uh, the level of competitive advantage that's give, that gives you, and, and why is that unique in the marketplace? Yeah. Yeah, so from a competitive advantage, no customer wants to be locked in. You know, when I talk with organizations, literally the number one, two, three concerns that I hear from organizations thinking about the public cloud is one, they don't want to be locked in, and two, they want to make sure that it's secure. Those are the two most common things that I hear. And so as we are delivering on this consistency across clouds, we can promise and we can demonstrably prove that when you develop an application to run on Windows Server, or an application to run in Windows Server, you can move those applications and VMs and services across the clouds, and you are not locked into any single cloud. You know, the business, the business needs change. You know, today you could be running in a private, but tomorrow, for whatever reason, you may need to expand that out, you may run out of capacity, and you want that flexibility, and that's what we deliver. So, Brad, you talk about the organizations coming together, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the Azure Cloud piece and your organization. Um, and there may be some, some internal plumbing, but, but, um, but I'm curious as to how you guys deal with sort of the Azure as a service versus Azure on, on, on premise and the channel dynamic there that's, that's changing. Right now, I mean, historically Microsoft has sold to its, its partners, still does, but the cloud somewhat changes that. And, and there's somewhat of a, somewhat counterpoised to your objective is to put stuff in, presumably on premise and support you know, hybrid clouds. How does that all, all work, and how do you see those shifting sands? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, so there's a couple of key metrics that as I think about the business that I track, you know, things like I watch what's happening with x86 server sales, because that kind of tells me, am I going to sell more Windows Server, or am I going to sell less? Because if servers are growing, the, the hardware, we're going to sell more Windows Server. So maybe a way to answer your question is, what are, the, what are the metrics that I track when I take a look at our hosted revenue compared to, say, Amazon, okay? When I do that comparison, I take the combination of Windows Azure revenue and the, and the revenue that's coming from our service providers who are leasing Windows and leasing out our applications out to, part, uh, out to customers, and I think about that combination versus Amazon as the metric. So I think about our service providers and then building a business aligned with what we're doing in Azure. And I, and I think that's fair. I mean, you've been actually criticized for counting that way, but to me it's a fair uh, uh, calculation because it's the TAM. 
I mean, whether it shifts from you know, this container to that container, it really doesn't matter. It's solving a, a problem that's, that's similar. But, the, but at the same time, don't the channel dynamics change? Um, I think the cloud changes everything. Yeah, so I wonder if you could talk about that and how your partners are responding. Yeah. You know, so what we've, what we've tried to do is we've tried to build out our compensation package, or our, our, our incentives for the channel, so that as they're out and they are selling, say, for Office 365 or Windows Intertune, our, 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 our software as a service offerings, that, you know, they get an annuity that comes into them. And so, you know, literally what they can do is, I think that more, our channel partners can find more customers to go to, and as they get more of those customers using our software as a service, those annuities just continue to build on each other. You know, and annuities are great things. As long as the customers continue to use our software as a service offerings, like Office 365, that annuity comes back to that channel partner that helped them get there. Now let me give you another example. Windows Intune is, is our management and protection solution delivered from the cloud. Okay, so think about this as kind of system center configuration manager and system center endpoint protection delivered from the cloud. So we now are able to host the solution up in the cloud. So we, we, we host the infrastructure, those types of pieces. But it still requires some level of knowledge, some level of expertise on how you package up your applications, how you put those applications into the service. And so a lot of our partners still see that opportunity to be that expert, to be that trusted advisor, to actually help it do. But they no longer have to worry about when we come out with a new version of our solution taking six months or eight months to actually do the upgrade deployment. Customers get value on day one when we put the new capabilities in the service. And so I think that's a win-win because customers get value instantly, our partners get the opportunity to still be that trusted advisor, and our partners get that annuity coming into them I in the same way that we get the annuity coming in from the subscription. So, so Brad, it, it's interesting to hear you talk about lock-in. And when I hear you talk about licensing and annuity, of course, one of the biggest criticisms of Microsoft typically is, you know, I, I've got licensing fees. You know, um, you know the Linux obviously has tried to attack Microsoft for years. The OpenStack community is trying to change what VMware's doing and what you guys are doing. Um, you know, so how is the cloud kind of changing how Microsoft looks at, uh, you know, this whole pricing dynamic? And, you know, is Microsoft's tune on, uh, you know, licensing changing? You know, so first of all, I, I think that there is a, is a right to protect your IP. You know, if you're investing like we are, where we're investing 10 plus billion dollars every year in development, you know, you do have the right to protect that IP, and I think you have the right to monetize that. Now, I think the, the, the way to think about this is, is to think about the total cost of ownership. And so when you think about any software, whether it's on-premises, whether it's a software as a service offering, there's a certain amount of value and there's a certain amount of utility that comes to the customer from that solution. And in terms of if they're hosting it on their own, they've got hardware costs, they've got software costs, they've got people costs, and let's be honest, the software cost for a service, or for a solution that people have deployed on-premise, is less than five or 6% of the total cost of ownership. You know, so if you go take a look at the research that's been done about what it costs to host, for example, SAP or Oracle in your data center, the software aspect, especially the software aspects that come into Microsoft, is a very, very small fraction of that. And, and, and so our strategy has always been, we believe that we offer great value at a very economic price. And I think we've, we, we've shown time after time after time that we are the low price provider in the market. Um, and that has always been our strategy. I think that will continue to be our well, strategy. Well, that's how Microsoft's ascendancy occurred, I and mean, frankly, it would, and certainly in the, in, the, in the PC era. And then, you know, people used to, it's ironic, right? People used to say, oh, it's just, you know, PCs, it's toys, and now Microsoft's the dominant player in the enterprise because you were able to take that ethos and bring it in. So the transaction costs, you're right, are, are, are tiny compared to the overall cost of ownership. But now then the cloud comes in, mm -hmm. and there's this whole new dynamic of CapEx versus OpEx, and, but you're playing there too. So yeah, and just to kind of build on that for a minute, you know, if, if someone sits down and says, hey, what's my total cost of ownership per mailbox to, to run Exchange in my environment? They've got hardware costs, they've got, again, they've got the software costs, they've got the people costs. When a new version of that comes up, they've got the cost to plan and orchestrate that upgrade. Our proposition here is we can host all that up for you in Office 365 in the cloud, and we will do it at a lower price, and it'll be at a predictable price. You know, a bad day for IT is when they overrun their budget. And in these large kind of uh, infrastructure upgrades, there's always risk that you're gonna, you know, you, you, you've know, you missed something in your planning and something happens and then you overrun your budget. The beauty of a service like Office 365 is the day that we release new capabilities, all that value is available to all the customers around the world and they don't have to go through any kind of an upgrade process. But when I think a lot of, about a lot of the Microsoft applications, I say, wow, they're just, they're perfect for the cloud. So what's, mm -hmm. W where are the headwinds in terms of customers going to the cloud? Is no, it that's a great question. Uh, it's a great question. First of all, let me, let me make one, um, just to give, give one point that maybe a lot of people don't know about. Today, Office 365, one out of four enterprise organizations in the world are using Office 365. 
and, and you know, just for so we have kind of all working on the same kind of uh, baseline here, our definition of the enterprise is very broad. Our definition is any organization in the world that has more than 500 PCs. You know, we call that the enterprise because that's where we kind of see, you know, the, the, the IT uh, administrators move from kind of generalist to specialist. It's real IT. Specialist. I mean, I mean, yeah, 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 that's a good way to say it. It's from generalist to, to, to specialist. Yeah. So one out of four are using Office 365. You know, we've talked about Office 365 being the fastest growing product in the history of Microsoft. So uh, what are the headwinds? You know, one, a lot of organizations are, 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 are con concerned about security. Okay, so when we're, when we're selling in a cloud-based solution, there's a lot of conversation that we have to demonstrate what we have done to secure the, the, the organization's content and their data. Okay, that's, that's one question. Two, there, there are, are, are a number of verticals that are highly regulated. Okay, and a lot of those highly regulated organizations will probably keep a lot of their applications on-premises in a private cloud uh, you know, for, for many, many years into the future. And then third, I think it's just unknown. You know, it's something that is dramatically new that a lot of the world is just not accustomed to, they just haven't tried it. And so a lot of what we've been trying to do is build out these easy scenarios where an organization can do like backup to the cloud. Get, get familiar with it, right? You can do all your backup to, to Windows Azure through the Windows Azure backup. The data is encrypted at your premises, it's encrypted on the wire, it's encrypted up in Azure, and you hold the keys, the keys never come to us. So the data is secure, but it gives you the experience of getting comfortable with what the cloud and, means. And I feel like the third one, the unknown, is probably the, the, the biggest reason, because I, I, I mean, what percent of organizations can, can build security better than Microsoft can build security? I would say it's, a, it's single digits. Matt, can, I, can, I, can I coach you on that? Yeah, yeah absolutely, right. I mean, I, I mean this, I've said, the cloud guys are, better at security yeah. than the vast majority yeah. of, of You have to be, because you're, you're in a constant attack. And, and the compliance piece, you know, maybe that's just experience, but I mean, you can provide compliance in a variety right. of different industries. Uh, and a lot of, I mean, Azure and all of our, our, our services have been certified in a number of the different certifications, and so, you know, those come, but I think you're right, the comfort level and, and, and just the, the willingness to embrace something new is, 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 the, is the biggest thing. I mean, barrier. the cloud reminds us, in some regards, it's not perfect analogy, but it reminds me of the mainframe days when we were doing downsizing and all the applications that should go went. Yep. You know, yep. and it was it ultimately became, mm -hmm. you know, the de facto. And I feel yeah. like the same thing's gonna happen. So maybe here. something to kind of say is so what, what advice would we give to organizations looking Great. at the cloud? You know, literally identify an application in your organization that you can move to the cloud and go get experience. You know, there, there, is, there is no substitute for experience. So look at one of your applications, doesn't have to be a mission critical thing and move it up into Azure and get that experience, ask the questions, develop that muscle, and then what, what, what we find is once they get up there and they, and they get comfortable, it just starts to accelerate. And then maybe the hardcore transaction processing stuff stays, you know, and you build a brick wall around that, perhaps. It could be, but I don't, I don't, think, I don't think it's really due to hardcore transaction processing. Actually, you have unlimited transaction processing up in the cloud. Right? right? So Brad, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how much does mobility play into what you and your team are working on? So define mobility for me, so make sure we're on the phones, same page. phones, tablets, things like okay, that. Okay, all right, so now we're talking about Desktop. BYO, yeah. how we enable users, okay. Yeah. So I'll tell you, the vision that I have for the team is our, our responsibility is how do we help organizations work on the devices that they love while helping IT ensure that the corporate assets are secure and protected, okay? That really is, is the mission and the vision that we have for the part of the organization that works on what we call the enterprise client. You know, so if you take a look at the assets we have in the place, first of all, System Center Configuration Manager is the de facto standard for managing desktops around the world. With, with, you know, we manage more than two out of three desktops in, in the enterprise worldwide, so it's a very, very large installed base. You know, we have assets like Office 365. For the last two and a half years now, we've taken System Center Configuration Manager and we built it for the cloud, and that's called Windows Intune. You know, we've talked about we have more than 10,000 organizations around the world who are using Windows Intune to actually manage their PCs and manage their devices. And because that's a service, we're constantly updating that. So in the fall of last year, we updated that with, you know, with, 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 an, with an update to Windows Intune. And in that Intune, all of the mobile device management settings that organizations require across Windows, iOS, Android, that is natively a part of Windows Intune. And then we've done this, I think a wonderful job of taking Intune and Config Manager and connecting those so that the System Center Configuration ma uh, uh, Manager uh, administrators can do all their administration of their, of their devices and their PCs. We then communicate those policies up into the cloud because we believe your devices should get policy from the cloud. Right? Those devices were made to consume cloud services. And so they, while they get policy from the cloud, you can do all your administration, all your reporting from your on-premises console. So Brad, my penultimate question, well first of all, thank penultimate, you. Penultimate, okay. Yeah, so it's by my <laughs> David Floyer, my English colleague. You know, second to last for those of you who don't know. But so my, uh, uh, my question is, uh, if 
So first of all, thank you for coming oh, to my this pleasure. event. Thank it's you. Regional events, great to have a senior executive from Microsoft here. So we really appreciate the support. Um, if you if you think about, um, we're here for let's say a year from now, yeah. and you had to write the bumper sticker on 2014. What do you want that bumper sticker to say as you're Ooh, leaving wow. Gillette Stadium and uh, in 2015? You're looking back and saying, all right, this is what we accomplished. What's that bumper sticker? That's a darn good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's so many things you want to do. What's the one I, I, I would have it done? We can you narrow know, the context if you want in terms of no, keeping no, it in the virtualization you know, or, you know. At, at a high level, really our desire is to help organizations cloud optimize their business. And so I think if there's a bumper sticker, it would be cloud optimized. Yeah, and when, when I say cloud right. optimized, it really is how do we help organizations embrace the concepts of cloud computing? And really, how do they differentiate and accelerate their businesses by adding value that is unique from the cloud into their organizations? And so I think that bumper sticker should say cloud optimized. Great, awesome. All right, my last question is any predictions for the for the Super Bowl, right? You got you got a team in the Yeah, go right? Seahawks. Go right, Seahawks, they're looking looking good. I mean, you must be excited. Oh, you know, Pete Carroll, you've spent a lot of time here. Yeah. We like Pete. He know. was here, you know. <laughs> You know, so I'm kind of in dangerous territory here. So I, you know, I, I, it's you good. Know, we had a good, good uh, brawl with you guys last year. Yeah. You eked it out at the end. It was a great game. I think all, all yeah. I can say is, you know, I'm hoping for a Super Bowl that's the Seahawks and the Patriots. Yeah. You know, and then and then I'll I'll, I'll have my Seahawks jersey thrilled. on to be we cheering. Would, we would be thrilled with like that, but I'm sure you know Seahawks and anybody would make you happy. And it's just as Patriots. Yeah. And no, it's but exciting. Luck, you know, it's, it's exciting. A, it really is. You guys have had an amazing two seasons, and uh, wish you the best up up in Seattle. So. All right, well listen, thanks very much, Brad, for coming on theCUBE. It was a pleasure having you. Pleasure's mine, thank you. Thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. I'll be back with Stu Miniman. We're live, this is theCUBE. We're here at Gillette Stadium at the VTUG, Winter Warmer. We'll be right back.